Hello and welcome to the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council's COVID Coffee Chat on registering people experiencing homelessness to vote in the upcoming election. I am Katherine Kavanaugh, the consumer advocate for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council in Nashville. I am based out of Baltimore. We call these gatherings coffee chats because they are informal conversations. We would invite you to get a cup of coffee or your lunch and listen and discuss. This is an opportunity for all of us to share questions, ideas, challenges, and support for each other. We hope that you're able to share your comments and questions throughout. One of the best parts of having these coffee chats is getting to hear from people who are doing similar work across the country. We want to hear from you and we would welcome your stories and questions throughout the chat. The more that you engage with the chat, the better the chat will be. You can type directly into the attendee chat pod on the right of your screen. Your comments will show up to all participants and I will refer to comments and questions to the panelists as they come in. Now I am thrilled to introduce our panelists for the day. With me I have Megan Hustings, an organizer with the National Coalition for the Homeless in Washington, D.C., and Tamisha McPherson, the Chief External Affairs and Development Officer at Harlem United in New York City. Both of these ladies are doing wonderful work on voter reg registration, which I'm excited to share with everyone. And I wanted to let people know off the bat about one resource for voter registration. Um, just given the state of COVID and the pandemic, early on a lot of organizations thought about how to get registration more virtual and getting online options to make sure that people could register to vote. One of these is Vote ER. It's a web portal that will help people determine their registration status, register to vote, or request a mail-in ballot. So if you see our resources pod down at the bottom of your screen, um, there's a link directly to the, our webpage. It's just vote-er.org backslash NHCHC. Uh, and so that's a website where people can go to to directly determine their status or request a ballot. So we would ask if you guys are looking for a way to engage with registration, uh, that sending out this link to your staff and your clients is a good way to get this out there. Um, I know you can add this to your uh, email signature. This is something that all of us as staff at the council did. Um, you, can, you can also uh, download some resources. We have in the resource pod um, badges or phone lock screens with QR codes where people can uh, scan the QR code and then be taken directly to that link. So just wanted to start off our discussion here today with one resource that people can use to engage people experiencing homelessness in voting uh, and make sure that we pass along this vote ER um, message as much as possible. There is also a great text option. Um, if you see a little text vote NHC, NHCHC to four, Three four 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 four, so it's four fours is the easiest way to remember it. A three and then four fours, and just text both NHCHC to that number, um, and that's a way to just send it to your phone. I checked out this process before, and it worked really well. Um, but now I think we'll get into our discussion with some of the experts on the call. Um, so I would just open it up to uh, Megan and Tamisha to hear about. A little bit more background on what your organizations are and what you are doing, what voter registration activities you're coordinating. Um, so I might start with Megan to give us the national perspective on what the National Coalition is doing. Sure thing. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. Megan Hussing is the National Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, we have been running the uh, hey. You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign uh, since the 1990s, really. Uh, it's been an effort to uh, ensure that people who are experiencing homelessness can access uh, and, and vote, uh, um, cast their ballot, um, register just the same as everyone else. Uh, we have, over the years, put in the effort to uh, work with states, AG's offices, or, or whatever the, the state election commission is to ensure that uh, the lack of a permanent address doesn't prevent somebody from um, from being able to fulfill their civic duty. Uh, now, you know, there's a number uh, every state has slightly different regulations around this, but uh, in every state you do not need a home to vote. Uh, the, the regulations about using an address um, differ from, you know, being able to, to put in your 
uh, like a cross street if you're staying outdoors um, to using a, a shelter and other service program where you might be receiving your mail um, as your location to vote. So just a little bit of, of what we've been doing. Um, we really encourage uh, all service providers to ensure that, that registration is uh, a part of you know, your intake process, your check-in process that, that case managers and case workers are uh, ensuring, especially now, um, but always, too, that, um, that their clients are, um, have their registration up to date uh, and are able to access the polls, too. It's, um, we don't always talk as much about getting out the vote, but that's it's just as important uh, as registering folks. Uh, so the, I'll, I'll start out with that. Thank you. Tamisha, do you want to share what Harlem United is doing this year? Sure, and I'll share a little Everybody bit about Harlem Yeah, I'll share a little bit about Harlem United as well. So um, Harlem United has was founded in 1988, 1988 um, and is a full service community health center that provides not only compre comprehensive uh, treatment in our clinics, but we also have supportive housing, a prevention department, and supportive services. Uh, and just to give everyone a snap snapshot, we have about 31 sites across New York City. Um, we have a Article 28 and a 31, which is the Office of Mental Health, and the 28 is actually our Medicaid uh, facility where we actually um, have our FQHC. Um, what I wanted to share with you of what we're doing um, over the next few weeks uh, what we are going to be doing, we actually are going to be educating all staff across the agency. There have been training set up um, for each department that I mentioned, that's health services, supportive housing, prevention, and supportive services. And uh, since day one, Harlem United's goal has been increasing access to care for members of our community and really sharing with um, staff as well as clients, voting is a key way our clients can actually demand more access and power for their community. So our voting drive plan consists of case managers who will speak to our all clients in their caseload before October 5th um, in order to make the New York State guidelines and uh, cutoffs, which is October 9th, to make any changes. Um, so the goal of all case managers is to talk to everyone on their caseload by October 5th. During check-ins with clients across all sites, staff will, uh, will ask if they plan to vote in the general election this November. And then staff will use a guide. That's the training that we're going through um, over the next, actually, one was yesterday. We have one next week, two next week. Um, a guide to walk step-by-step -step through the process of check the current voter registration, updating name or address on registration, registering to vote and applying to uh, vote absentee. Um, and then we are going over rules of what we can and cannot do and the step-by-step -step process. So I think that's it. That is a lot, but that's, that's it for now. Yeah, those are amazing steps. I think getting both the housing providers and the healthcare providers engaged, bringing everyone in for a full-fledged effort is really impressive. Um, so what, as you guys have been doing this work, what barriers have you found to registering people experiencing to vote during the pandemic? What has it been like in New York? What have the barriers been? Tamisha? Tamisha, you might be on mute. Oh, right, I am. Um, the kickoff, our kickoff actually starts on Tuesday of next week, but we have been engaging uh, a few clients just to get a feel of what um, we can anticipate um, next week and then voter registration day, which is the 22nd. Um, I will tell you a few people had various addresses since the last election and not sure where, which that's information that we um, have been a, or can look up. The other... Um, people just not feeling the energy. And we had one person share with us that they um, didn't think it would make sense or their vote didn't count. And we are able to explain that um, it will and it, and it can. 
because if you don't vote, we may not be here. That was a good example that I shared with them um, that is very important. There's a lot of risks and, and um, concerns around the business that we're in right now, working with the homeless as well as um, FQHC. So we, it's, it's just great that our staff are being educated on what to say and educate themselves that they can actually engage clients and keep them engaged. And what we can't do is force anyone to do anything, but we can educate you with the information that we do have. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a good point. We see a lot of the passion and the energy in the streets with some of this uprising around the oppression and suppression that's been going on in our country lately, but I think we have to acknowledge that as much as there are some people who are energized by this moment, there are a lot of people who are disengaged and by just all of the additional barriers are just feeling more um, disenfranchised than usual. So I think acknowledging that was is important. Thank you. Um, Tamisha. Megan, yeah. what other barriers have you guys seen nationally? Well, and to, to that point, I, I think that commonly um, the research has shown that people with lower incomes vote at lower rates than, than people with higher incomes uh, just across the board. And you know, that's, that's for a number of reasons. But you know, we've always seen that ID, um, lack of a, a current photo ID is a, a huge barrier. We, we all know folks lose their, um, lose their personal items, they get stolen. Um, they get, you know, quote unquote, cleaned, thrown away by by a city who's who's going through an encampment. Uh, ID is something that that folks really lack, and that's really hard to to recover. So those states that uh, say that you have to have a current photo state issued ID to register and or to vote, that's a, a huge issue. A uh, huge barrier to, to a lot of the folks that we serve. Uh, I think uh, other barriers uh, besides the ones that um, you know, we kind of mentioned that just whenever someone feels uh, like they're not truly engaged, like their vote doesn't matter, it's not just um, poor or homeless folks that feel like that way. Uh, a lot of people have come to that understanding. So it, you know, we're glad that. Tamika and her staff are, are really working hard to, to combat that, and we've always, uh, we, we actually have a little one-on-one, uh, -on -one, a little uh, sample kind of dialogue in our voting rights manual that's up on our website uh, that, that we, we aim to kind of help talk through that sentiment that, you know, my vote just doesn't matter, that it doesn't, you know, doesn't, it's not going to mean much, it's not going to really affect my life. Um, We've also seen that uh, there's a fair amount of election officials, especially when they come down to local, you know, uh, even at the polls sometimes, the election officials don't always understand what the state regulations are around, what kind of address is needed to register or to vote. Um, we're, we're right now, we're working with some pro bono lawyers to try to understand what uh, state offices that oversee elections, what kind of training they're offering to election officials, um, because this is a, a huge problem. I mean, even if the state says, you know, you can you can use uh, whatever location where you're sleeping, you know, it's if it's on the form, the registration form, where if it clearly states that you can use any address, there, there's still a disconnect. Even when you come to the polls, sometimes. Uh, the election official will say, oh, well, this doesn't match your ID, or you know, there's all kinds of issues. So there's, there's education, I think, that needs to happen of election officials. Um, and then, I, I, you know, I think we have to understand, too, I mean, we all know this, but that homelessness is traumatic. Uh, and you know, it's more than just feeling disengaged or uh, like your vote doesn't matter. A lot of folks are kind of in survival mode. Uh, and thinking about voting, thinking about candidates, trying to make the effort to uh, go find your polling location or update your registration. It's kind of, it can be seen as outside of, you know, the basic, your basic needs, you know, your basic everyday survival needs. Uh, it, it just kind of like goes to the wayside sometimes, which is completely understandable, um, but something that we should all be aware of. 
Yeah, thank you both. And I think there's another question here from Regina in the chat that I think goes to kind of where we're at in this COVID world is that a lot of the changes and shifts have been moving towards mail-in ballots or online campaigns. Even our Vote ER campaign is online. And just wondering with the expansion of mail-in ballots, how many people, where people have access to getting their mail, um, wondering about health centers, just getting additional, having the capacity to take in all of the ballots and making sure that people can uh, get their ballots in time to send them back. Uh, but I think, so I think we heard yesterday we had a policy committee meeting of uh, organizations, I think it was in Albuquerque, thinking about how to get community groups and church organizations and more kind of community partners, grassroots organizing groups engaged in providing addresses for people. So it's not uh, going to all be congregated towards sending all of the mail-in ballots towards the shelter or the health center where people have to coordinate it, but maybe sending mail-in ballots across to a broader range of service providers or community partners, um, which sounded like a good idea. Um, but also wondering about the lack of technology when a lot of places have libraries closed and how people are able to access uh, Wi-Fi and um, voter registration materials online. So I think those are a little bit of some of the challenges. And then I just want to go come back to you guys with all of that in mind. Um, how have you thought about ways to overcome some of these challenges during these times? So I can jump in. I, I, we pretty much have an outline of what we're doing because we're doing a lot, most of it on the phone, but uh, for people that we can't get in touch with and clients, we are promoting that they come out. We will have about eight people on the ground um, on the 15th meeting in front of 125th Street in Harlem um, on two blocks, 125th which is the heart of Harlem, 125th and Lenox Avenue, and 124th Street. Uh, so we've been promoting that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what the process looks like because, I mean, the way it's outlined looks very easy, but I don't know. You know, we'll see how this goes, but it basically has given us everything that we need. So, you know, I'm going to walk through this for about two minutes, um, and you'll have a better understanding how we're doing this. So we are going to ask if they are registered. If they are have you moved or changed your name since you registered? And then we have a yes, no, and I don't know. Um, we're going to have capacity and tablets. Everyone will have tablets to actually look up the information um, and assist them and offer to look up their polling place. Then due to COVID, we recommend voting absentee. Would you like to apply for absentee ballot? We will offer that. Um, and then we have information that will go right directly to what we need to do. And then I'm skipping down to um, making sure everybody knows what determines the eligibility, which must be a U.S. citizen, must be a New York resident for 30 days, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to go down to homeless. So, Because we, we have 75% of our patient population um, meets the homeless criteria. So for voters experiencing homelessness, when registering these voters, uh, we should give the, uh, get the zip code and address of the location where they stay at night. This can be a shelter, a park, a street corner, or any, or any other location. They must also give a mailing address where they can accept mail. Some of that comes to us as a homeless uh, provider and FQHC. They prefer having their mail come here. Uh, provide the client with their polling place based on the home address they supply in the registration form. So that's a tidbit, and these are actually outlined for all of our employees to kind of walk through, and they'll be set up on tablets for everyone to kind of actually, depending on what you um, actually select, it'll take you to the document that you need to read uh, what's going on. And then the one thing that we decided to do as well, because most, if not all of our clients have phones, um, we will follow up and send a text to the client reminding them of their information that we shared with them, and then follow up again to make sure that they can remember if they get something in the mail and they don't have a stamp or whatever they need to mail it out or if it comes here, there, there will be follow-up, um, you know, uh, steps for both parties. But that's basically what we um, have planned so far um, to work with all of our clients, especially the homeless population. Thank you. And as we switch over to Megan to see what 
ideas you have for overcoming some of these challenges. I also want to acknowledge, I know there's a lot of expertise from folks who are in the room. So if you guys, if your organizations are doing any voter registration activities or have found ways to overcome some of these barriers, please share some any ideas or thoughts in the chat. Uh, and then Megan, do you want to give us your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. Um, echoing that, I know that, that um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of this type, type of format where everyone can jump in. Uh, because, it, you know, I, I think Tamisha and her organization, they're doing a fabulous job. And the, um, the kind of personal attention that she just described that um, they're going to be offering to their clients, uh, you know, is, is really good. We all need some extra support. We all need encouragement. I think that's probably one of the best ways that organizations can go about helping folks to cast their vote and to register is having that personal attention, you know, uh, not just blasting something out. Obviously, we, um, we're not gathering in, in large communities, um, even though some shelters still are, but there's, you know, we're just all distant from each other um, in one way or another. And, uh, you know, especially with more folks being placed into hotels or other non-congregate settings during COVID or if they're sick and in the hospital, you know, there's all kinds of situations where uh, we really kind of need that personal attention. So anything that case managers can do, uh, you know, those folks that are, are seeing people on a daily basis, I mean, even uh, peer support workers, you know, this is a great uh, opportunity for, for them to uh, encourage the folks that they're working with to, um, to register and kind of guide them through the process. Uh, so that, that's what I would say. And, you know, I think what you hear from Tamisha is that uh, while technology might be an issue, especially because libraries are closed, for, for the individual uh, organizations still have access. And there's so many websites. VoteR is, is fantastic. We have uh, a link on our website, nationalhomeless.org, uh, that you can click on to, to check your registration and make sure you can vote. There's a lot of good information on, on, online. Uh, this election cycle, a lot of organizations, national and local, uh, working to make information and access to the ballot easier for folks. Uh, I think we, as as organizations and those who serve people experiencing homelessness, um, will still be needed to to bridge that gap. So anything you can do, like Tamisha said, to to have that technology. A lot of us have laptops already, have smartphones. Um, folks who are doing outreach have access to technology can can add uh, just the quick process of checking someone's re registration fairly easily to um, you know to their process when they go out to see somebody. Yeah, thank you. And Tamisha, I know you're just getting started with the training and launching this new kind of form of voter registration this year, but just wondering from both of you, uh, from things you've heard or seen so far, what strategies have you, are, seem to be most effective in registering people to vote, to actually getting people to register? Um, I will tell you that we have incentives. It works for our client population here in New York. Um, so our, our Fund development team has actually been able to get donations, and again, it's pretty interesting um, because what the bulk of what we will be doing, um, some of it will be at our locations as well that I didn't mention. And even if you want to, if you would like an incentive, you would have to listen to what we have to say. Um, and that does catch people's attention. And it's sad to say this, but it happens and it, it works. Um, so we have giveaways, I will say that. Um, the other part of this, too, will be when we're in the community on the 15th and the 22nd. Again, we'll be on the ground outside with our masks and our uh, Harlem United gear uh, so people know who we are. But we will be giving away things as well, and it will be you know, on our backpack. And again, we're trying to limit any touching with anyone, um, and we've gone through training with that where we're, we'll be speaking to people um, and we'll be able to um, update their information and everything. And if they decide and they still don't want anything, we will now turn that conversation and engage them to see if they need any services. Um, so we do have a two-step process that if they're 
not interested or they're already registered, to tell them a little bit about Harlem United as well um, and see if they've had a uh, you know, recent appointment and, and a little bit about who we are. Um, so we do have some plans that we'll tell you over the phone, and I didn't mention this early, I think it's important to mention this, we have um, experienced barriers with people that cannot read and write. So we're asking those that may have a phone, but they don't have the capacity to go to a website to update anything. Those clients we are asking to come in. We have limited amount of staff coming in daily now. Not everyone, is, I don't think, will ever be back the way it was. But um, we are coordinating that staff can come in and work. Excuse me, clients will come in to speak to the, the staff about registering and doing what they need to do. And we, have, we will have rooms set up as of next week for that as well. So we pretty much have a plan for all of the barriers that we have seen and heard of thus far. And there may be more when we're out, um, but yes. Yeah, and I would say I just I love the idea of yeah getting your case managers involved and having adding this as a task on somebody's job to be checking in with people about uh, their voter registration. I think that's a good way to show uh, the organizational commitment to voting rights as a part of health. Uh, Absolutely, Megan. Yeah, what other strategies have you seen nationally that have worked really well for uh, registering people to vote? So I think I'd go back to, to the individual again um, in our in, in the manual that we have on our, our website, the kind of toolkit that we've put together, um, made a, a kind of cheesy little cartoon that goes through some common excuses that, that people might say for why they don't want to vote or why they don't want to register. And, um, and hopefully that gives some, uh, some, uh, some encouragement to, to those of us who are trying to get past um, some of those barriers and to support folks. You know, I, I think when um, we're left to our own devices, and this goes for anyone, homeless or not, um, you know, we can forget about things, we can let things slide, you know, we all have different priorities in our lives. Um, but, you know, when we remind folks that um, that their their vote matters, you know, just how, how much uh, of our lives and our, our, you know, support systems, our safety net is governed by those people that we elect, uh, it's, it's just really critical. And I, I hope that, um, I know that the National Coalition, and I, I know that the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, too, since we do advocacy on a daily basis, we're, we're working with uh, folks on the Hill or even in, in state or city um, legislative bodies. It, it really matters. It really matters a lot who you elect and also just you, everyone's participation in the, not only the electoral process, but uh, in in uh, evaluating and continuing to contact your elected officials, uh, it's it's really critical in uh, providing the the resources that we all need to stay housed, um, you know, to, to get everybody off the streets, to get everybody the healthcare that they need. Uh, it, it, it's all really closely tied to our elections and our legislative process. Absolutely. And I will um, note for people, if you, the coalition's toolkit, you don't need a home to vote toolkit, is in our resources pod. Um, so if you guys want to go check that out, we've got that one as number six. There's also a few other good resources. If you guys haven't checked out the resources pod, there's some good toolkits there and information there that you can use to help people learn about registration information. And as we're kind of coming up towards our, our last official discussion question, I just want to ask people what's on your mind in the, in the room. So if you guys have additional questions about registration activities you are thinking about putting together, or if you have ideas, things that, about successful registration activities other people could try, uh, please feel free to engage in the chat and ask questions. Um, and so then we'll move to our last official question for this discussion uh, and just asking what advice you guys have for other communities who are trying to set up re registration activities. And so I'll start, Tamisha, as you guys have thought about your plan and set up doing this really intentionally, what, what advice do you have for other communities wanting to do something similar? I would just say plan um, ahead. And we, uh, have been planning for this for the last two weeks, and I will tell you the obstacles that came up was really just getting the information from 
you know, any changes that came up to New York City, offices are closed, people are not answering the phone, so it did delay things a bit. That's why earlier when you mentioned you had thought we started already, but it was out of our hands some of the, the information or a lack of information of getting it in a timely manner. And then the other thing I would say, um, I, I thought it was great that our CEO um, was able to not only uh, promote but support at all levels through the agency to, to participate and include everyone. And it's not mandatory, but it's optional. And, and I can't even explain to you how many people we have that want to volunteer, so it's just amazing. But that does come with coordination and, and training. Um, it's not just volunteering, it's going through the appropriate training. And we are quizzing people to make sure that, one, you feel comfortable sharing this information and have a now level of confidence of what you're talking and discussing and what links and, and having everything in front of you um, to convince that other person, one, in, that's in front of you at that time, and if you don't, you know, that the engagement skills that come with that. So we have some people that will be, you know, out front, uh, meaning on the ground with us, and then we have some people that we will be working behind the scenes. So the point is would be definitely training and, and prepping people um, um, what could and can happen. And um, this is something that we've been doing for years, so this is not new for us. It's just new due to COVID of the, um, the changes that we've had to make um, to really make sure that we um, make a difference in the community. Yeah, thank you. And I'll add, yeah, things are changing on state levels, yeah, day by day as uh, changes and elections are happening or new things are being decided. Um, so it is just for people, if you are looking for information in your state, um, Nonprofit Vote has a great website. It's number five in the resources about voting information by state. So you can see what is the latest um, in your state to learn, like, when are the deadlines to register? Are you able to register same day? Uh, and, and do that, and where are polling locations, and just find out more of that information. Um, are they mailing out ballots to everyone? Some states are doing that. Uh, so you can find out more of that information in that voting information by state page on that resources pod. And Megan, uh, what advice do you have for communities who are setting up registration activities during a pandemic? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I'd say thank you, uh, and, and I think everyone needs to be doing this too. Um, but uh, really critical, Tanisha t touched on this, you did too, uh, I think understanding what your, um, your state's guidelines and regulations are uh, is going to be really key, uh, especially as organizations. We can, we can spend the time to do the research. So uh, the nonprofit boat is a good place. There, there's lots of different websites that will have information. We are working, they're not available yet, unfortunately, but in the next week they will be up on our website, uh, state by state, know your rights cards um, that will detail, you know, what address you need, um, you know, when you can, what are the, what's the deadline to register, a little bit more updated information. The, our toolkit right now does have state by state information that it's about a year old. Um, so some of it is still current, some of it's not. Obviously, there's a, a lot more states that are making mail-in ba ballots an option. Uh, so you know, take the time to research, understand what, what's, uh, what your state's laws are. I will say, too, I think that um, uh, one question that comes up a lot for um, organizations when they're trying to do registration or even get out the vote thrive is that um, is trying to understand what we can do as nonprofits. And just to, to say again that as a nonprofit, uh, we can register folks to vote in a nonpartisan way. We can't say anything that will um, show a preference to one candidate or another or one party or another. Uh, you know, anyone who wants to should be able to register through your processes. Uh, and information should be given out equally to everyone. Uh, same thing with voting. You can help people get to the polls. You can get volunteers to drive folks. That might be a little bit harder with COVID, but um, you know, any kind of support that you can offer, again, just has to be nonpartisan. Uh, but it's perfectly all right uh, to, to help people cast their vote. Uh, 
and that's all, so always very important to, to understand. Uh, yeah, I see Carlton put in the chat. Yes, we're we're working with the law center um, <laughs> on the cards. Uh, and we're we're really excited to get those out. So, um, but we'll also have links to uh, the uh, the state by state election website. If you have a question that's not answered in our information or the Use Know Your Rights card, um, your election office is always a good place to go. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to put out one last call if there's any questions from any attendees, if you have any thoughts or questions you want to ask about registration activities. Um, and as people are thinking about their final questions, I'll just wanted to give a second for Tamisha or Megan, if there's anything important about voter registrations or your processes or engaging people with this process that we haven't talked about that you think we should talk um, or talk more about something that we may have glimpsed over. For me, I think we covered a lot. Um, I'm going to do what I did, as, you know, what we learned in the training. Everybody on the phone, if you're not registered or you make sure you changed any address or anything like that, make sure. I mean, I just think it's important, and I thought it was very helpful for the training um, and really engaging everyone. Um, Megan brought up a good point that was part of our training. I mean, I can't go through the 36 slides that we have, but we have a whole list of do's and uh, do not um, in regards to um, nonpartisan and making sure that you don't, you know, say or sway people to, to vote for who. I mean, it, it, we have everything in there, so that was a very good point. Um, but yes, those are my thoughts. I mean, I just hope that everybody's taking um, the election very serious. Um, it's a very important year, which is every four years, but this year is even more important. And uh, yeah, that's all, and thank you for listening and participating. Yeah, and so I think similar to, along those lines, I think this is a, a good question coming in for you, Tamisha. Um, as you guys are doing these in-person events and thinking about COVID, um, what special health and safety guidelines are you giving people about this in-person work? I know you said you guys are providing um, protective personal equipment for people, but uh, what kind of guidance are you giving for folks? So it's the regular guidance even when they come to work. So everybody has to go to a full training. We will be geared up with our Harlem United gear, but we'll have our shields on, gloves. Um, there is no touching, no pictures, and any, anything like that. Um, and then we're rotating. So we're not going to be out for a, a whole day, but we'll have people every 30 minutes shifting because we had so many volunteers. Um, so we will not have, even the staff will, will be six feet apart. So this is part of the training on Monday, um, and those staff will be on site. Um, there will be some role play in one of our big conference rooms. So, And again, it's eight people that will be on the ground. Across the agency, uh, most, if not all, of the people, the case managers will not see people face to face. It's really the eight, including myself. Um, we were able to book um, a date on the 22nd with one of our senators to come out, just uh, just to provide some media attention and, and working um, with the community um, to just recognize how important it is to vote. So that's where we are. Hopefully I answered Regina's question in regards to training. And I see, okay, emotional and psychological uh, coping with this work. Um, out of the eight, four of them are social workers. So one is actually providing the training as well with the, the training uh, department um, in regards to even you never know what a client may say or trigger because we're also going through trauma-informed care training supposed to be face-to-face, -face, but now it's virtual. So all of this ties into the work that we do every day. So these are really good questions, and thanks, Regina, for asking. And I see you said I did answer, so thank you. 
Yeah, I think that's a good question. When we're talking about uh, earlier mentioning, right, just the trauma and disenfranchisement that people experiencing homelessness normally feel about systems and engaging with voting, but just then acknowledging the, the space that we're living in with racial inequities and COVID stress and the political stress and everything, just feeling that people are more disheartened. I'm just wondering, yeah, how in those conversations with people about why they should vote or how to engage now, what is some ways that you're ch trying to engage people or tell them why the value of voting and engaging now, even when people are feeling pretty hopeless? We'll go to that slide. We have a slide for that as well. Um, and let me just go to it. Oh, it goes back. I could have mentioned it before, but I can go. Um, we we mentioned to, or we have, we'll be sharing with clients who feel that their vote doesn't matter or it won't make a difference. We are reinforcing and reminding and educating the clients and patients that your vote will matter. Um, you make a difference. Not your your current living situation alone you know, or the services you receive from Holland United, all of those can change, and that could be, make a difference in regards to you voting or not. The other thing we are sharing with clients, because one of our programs actually helps clients uh, come out or move out of a shelter to, to go more independent, would be um, job readiness. So part of that would be important. You know, and it depends on the clients, because that's what we learned in the training. We don't want to talk to them about something that really has nothing to do with them. We will have access to the clients, especially case managers that know everybody's personal situation. Um, those challenges will probably be more challenging for people we don't know on the, you know, street when we're on the ground and talking to people. Um, but one thing we, we have been told is to educate and direct the anybody that we engage with to information, that they could get further information just to hear the benefits and, and how, because some people believe it or not, and I, we had this last so four years ago, um, people I we were engaging and never voted before, believe it or not, and they had access to vote, but they felt that it wouldn't make a difference. So us using personal examples of why you vote, from taxes to definitely what happens in your community, schools, it just makes a big difference in regards to your everyday lifestyle um, and, and, and what, what situation you're currently in. Um, but believe it or not, we have seen so much, and I've been at Harlem United going in 10 years in December, um, I've seen so much in, in regards to engaging our clients, and I'm looking forward to see what's going to happen on the 15th and 22nd on the ground. But we are well equipped to, to really educate people on, and really engaging and having a conversation with the individuals, because you do need to know a little bit more about them as well. If they're saying, no, I'm not interested or, um, or don't want to vote, we want to hear why. And that is a question um, that we should ask and can ask. And um, we have a large incarcerated population of people that have felonies and things like that, um, of educating them. And I have, I'm reading from what we have here. Cannot be serving jail time for a felony conviction. People who have been incarcerated for a felony conviction, conviction can vote in New York as soon as they are released, but must re-register. So we have a handful of clients in that situation that may have been released but didn't re-register. Um, but yes, I can go on and on about this because I've gone through, I went through all the trainings and we've been asked all these different questions and I was able to jump in because I've actually done this already uh, four years ago. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Megan, do you have any tips for keeping up morale with this work when it feels dismal? <laughs> um, if, if, I, if I knew how to do that, we, I'd be sharing that across the board. It's a tough time. I, you know, I think that um, any time that we can find community uh, and, and a chance to engage with one another, you know, whatever you can do to just commiserate, to 
to share, you know, similar experiences or similar feelings. Um, it, it, it is a very difficult time. I think just all the all the stuff that we've said before, uh, just the, the everyone's vote really matters. You know, as, as much as we can to to relate to folks that that's the case. Um, I think that uh, a lot of times uh, our work, at least ours at the national level, kind of beefs up for federal elections. But sometimes it's the local elections that uh, will make more of a difference in somebody's, someone's life, or at least you can see kind of the change in your own community a little bit more than, than sometimes you can see it on a national level. Um, so if that's ever an opportunity to engage with folks to uh, talk about your mayoral candidates or your city council candidates or even state legislator, le legislators or candidates who are running for um, governor, uh, you know, these are all offices that, that might have a little bit more effect on, on the day-to-day -day life of, of, you know, your clients, of your neighbors, of your community, um, that that sometimes can be an in and then the, the federal elections uh, that happen less often and less frequently, you know, can can be uh, more at the end of, of your argument than the beginning. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of go back quickly to, to something we were talking about before, um, uh, or maybe not. Well, just one thing that I thought of that we haven't really talked about yet, if that's okay, Catherine, I apologize if it's kind of throwing a wrench in things, but um, perfect. Okay. Um, if you are curious about, oh, this is what I was thinking. I'm sorry. Um, thinking about organizations and what's legal for us to do as nonprofits, uh, we can share information about uh, what candidates' positions are, especially on uh, uh, you know very broad issues, not necessarily specific pieces of legislation, but uh, you know as housing and homelessness and, and um, healthcare focused organizations, we can. Uh, definitely share what candidates are saying about those issue areas. And um, I was going to put something in the chat box, a link to a website that um, supposedly uh, will, will show you the positions of any candidate from, from citywide up to the federal level uh, and, and what they're saying about specific issues. Um, sometimes, again, kind of going back to this idea of, of local stuff, um, when you know what a candidate is saying about issues that are important to you. I think when we can explain how uh, how healthcare programs or you know how our programs, how the the services we're offering are funded, sometimes that can be another way to get past some barriers uh, with folks just to say, well, you know. Um, our, our our funding comes from Congress. It's allocated every year. Uh, and it's uh, our, you know, representatives and, and senators that will actually vote on how much money we're going to get or how much these types of programs across the country are going to get. Uh, and it m might be kind of a weird segue, but uh, the census has put out some, uh, they've done a lot of work this year on around encouraging people to participate in the census uh, but really showing that it affects our communities. Um, I mean, and obviously it's a little bit different than voting, um, but census numbers are used by a lot of federal programs to allocate funds. Uh, so, you know, again, just kind of thinking about how this affects our daily lives, um, how it affects our, our programs, our, um, the services we're able to offer, uh, sometimes that can break down some barriers too. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Thinking about the world can be kind of overwhelming right now. So asking people just to think about what is a little piece that they are passionate about or they care about or something that they can't engage with, um, making it smaller and more relatable to people. I appreciate that. Um, okay, and I have another question here from Natalie. Um, how are you guys overcoming challenges to register people who do not have a state ID to register online? or if they don't know their security number? Are you also doing paper registration? So I might hand that to Tamisha first and how you guys are doing? We are. We are doing paper and we'll take care of that and mail and do what we need to do. 
that's why we couldn't put this off any longer in regards to time frame, because as long as it's in, it's in the mail. And with those, we are asking clients if they don't have a permanent address to have it come to us, um, mail it back to us, meaning here at the agency. And I think I would add to, you know, again, the ID restrictions for registering and for voting um, vary by state. So it's really important to look at your state's um, information. Um, just just to note, too, I, I think Catherine mentioned this earlier, but you do have to be a citizen. So, um, you know, um, Natalie asked about people who don't know their Social Security number just in case there's folks who don't have a Social Security number. They probably aren't able to vote. Uh, just as a reminder, of course, we all know that the instance of um, voter fraud is extremely low. We know that there's not many people who shouldn't be voting who are voting. There's very, very, I mean, extremely few. Um, it's not swaying our elections. But, uh, you know, the, just, again, understanding kind of who is eligible. Um, I think, Tamisha, the... Um, New York is is one of the states that uh, is a little bit more giving with uh, people who have a felony conviction. There are some states who even a conviction will prevent you from voting. Uh, so again, that varies. Double check with your state to know exactly what those eligibility requirements are. Yeah, thank you. And I want to add a good note here from Darlene. Uh, another reason why to engage people is that people should understand that voting is not just about the next four years. It's about the next four, next four years, but it's about the next 40 years. Judges are nominated and selected. Therefore, it's important to make the connection between who is making the decision affecting us in the long term. And I think, yeah, we've seen a good example of that this year. Just there's a, a longstanding power. It's not just about the short term. So thanks for acknowledging that. I think that's important to bring up for folks. Okay. If there are any final questions that have come up for folks, if you want to put in any final questions in the chat box. As we move forward here, I just wanted to let people know about two national days that might be handy to plan something around. Um, so September 22nd is National Voter Registration Day. So if you guys want to launch a voter registration thing or try to do an event on the 22nd, let people know, pass around the link for votes ER on that day, but think about maybe doing something on the 22nd for voter registration. And then October 24th is National Vote Early Day. So just as we talked about earlier, uh, there's a number of us, a number of the spaces are moving towards mail-in ballots or just worried about congregating people during COVID at election centers. So we want to be encouraging people to early vote as much as possible. So there's a national day on October 24th if people want to do something at your organization to try to help get people out and voting that day or encouraging people. But I think that might be a, a good day to set an event around. And as we're talking about what it means to actually get out the vote, um, just let people know that we have our next part of this conversation next Friday. So this conversation we were really focused on registering people to vote and all of the barriers and challenges and opportunities and how we can get people registered to vote. But as we also mentioned, that just as important that we actually help people get out and vote and make sure people have access to voting uh, this year and are able to vote. So that's what we're going to focus on next week, focus on mobilizing people and how are we looking at mail-in ballots and early voting and other opportunities to make sure we're turning people out to vote. So please join us next Friday, same time, where uh, Megan will also be joining us again to share what the National Coalition is doing around this, mobilizing people. And then we'll have uh, Joey Lindstrom from Our Homes, Our Votes, which is a national campaign from the National Low-Income Housing Coalition that has done a lot of uh, work around voting and voting rights. If there are no more questions, I just I hope everyone is able to join us for our coffee chat next week. And please stay up to date with our communication. And uh, thank you. Yeah, if yes, presenters have any final comments, feel free to share. 
sorry. I was just I just want to say thank you to everyone and um, I, I know that uh, you all are doing a fantastic job. Uh, Tanisha, all the organizations that are working to register um, and, and engage homeless and low-income voters, just thank you. We need you all and, and you're doing fantastic work. No problem. Thank you. That's a great note to end on. So uh, thank, every, thank you everyone for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, the recording of this will be uploaded on the Council's website within three days. And at the end of this coffee chat, a survey will come up. If you could please complete that survey, let us know how this experience was for you so we can make sure we're providing beneficial learning opportunities for everyone.